Now this is where it gets interesting. So chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So notice that 14 years later, after Paul went to, was trained by God, talked to Peter to accumulate knowledge from him, accumulated knowledge from James, the Lord's brother, then 14 years later, he had to go back to Jerusalem to them again. What happened? Because in those 14 years, there's something going on here. Verse 2. So, uh, verse 1, Paul took Barnabas with him and Titus with him. Now, Barnabas is a Jew, but Titus is a Gentile. Now, there's a ruckus going around the Jews because they don't like Gentiles, especially if you're not circumcised. So, there's an issue going around here. Verse 2, and I went up by revelation. So, Paul received his revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. So, Paul, he was communicating to the Gentiles about the gospel he was preaching, but privately to them which were of reputation. So Paul, he only spoke about what he knew about the gospel privately to those who were of reputation, those who were like the prestigious pastors, right? So like Peter, prestigious pastor, James, prestigious pastor. So he was doing privately with them because he knows how the Jews would feel. Let's keep reading right here. Lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So Paul's saying that all the running, all the effort. So he was running his own race, which was preaching about that gospel that God clearly revealed to him. He's saying that all of that would have been in vain if he didn't keep hiding it. So he was like trying to hide it from the Jews, keep it secret, because he was focusing on the Gentiles, and only Peter and those of reputation knew that. Now here's something you gotta understand. Okay, if you don't believe, if you don't believe that there's a difference of the gospel that Paul preached, there was something different that he did be compared to others back then. Yes, the faith, we realize it was before Paul. There was elements of the gospel before Paul, but you got to realize it's, it's not as clear as he had it. So you can't, uh, you have to erase anti-dispensationalism. Salvation back then, the gospel back then, is not the same as us today. It was very different from back then. Because if they understood and got saved the same way like we did, you understand this, then why Paul, why was Paul hiding it? Uh -huh. If he was preaching the same thing like they did, then he would have said it boldly. There is no doubt there is something different here. Okay, so remember this. It is the same gospel Paul is preaching. But here's the idea. He knows more clearness of it that will get him in trouble with the Jews. The other people, they only knew tidbits of it back then. Only tidbits of it back then. So let's keep reading right here. We're going to look at verse 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Titus, who was with Paul, he was not persuaded by these people who tried to compel him, convince him that he had to be circumcised or follow Judaism. So look at Acts chapter 15. This is the key here, Acts 15. Look. If everyone, if all the Jews back at the Old Testament this, uh, disciples knew this very clearly, then there wouldn't be a ruckus and a fuss about this, concerning about you have to be circumcised or keep the law to get saved. They were arguing that you had to keep the law of Moses, you had to be circumcised for salvation. Didn't you know that? They had to argue about that. There was a big debate going about. There wouldn't have been a debate if they were all preaching the same thing. That's right. See? So there's no doubt there's a difference. We're going to look at Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised, after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When there, so there is a group of people saying you have to follow Moses' law, be circumcised for salvation. Verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. Yeah, it was not a small disagreement, small argument. No, this was big. This was big. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So here's the thing. They were telling Paul and Barnabas, then you go talk to the apostles over there and discuss this matter. Why would these Jews tell Paul to go to the apostles to discuss about this matter if they were all preaching the same way about the gospel? You wouldn't confidently say that. 
So it shows right here that there's something that Paul was re revealed something very clearly compared to others back then. They weren't revealed as clearly. Because remember, all they got was a mingling of knowledge of Jewish and Christian doctrines. That's what's going on in their heads. That's what's going on in their heads that time. Because they were ministering to Jews and Jesus Christ was introducing Christian doctrines to them. So there's this mingling that's going on in their head. And God, he was also transitioning from Jew to Gentile. So there's obviously a mingling going on here. That's why Paul, when he's showing his uh, clear doctrine of Christianity, and he was a minister to Gentiles, it's totally different. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Uh, let's see right here. Verse 5, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So notice right here, they believed in keeping the Old Testament law, circumcision for salvation right here. So that's the debate Paul was talking about. That's why he had to go back to Jerusalem. Okay, I just moved the board just now. I hope I didn't uh, ruin the cameras. But anyways, so we see right here, let's go back to Galatians chapter 2. And then uh, we'll read verse 4. And that because of false brethren unawares. Ah, so there's saved people around you, or they call themselves Christian or brethren. It's unaware. You have no knowledge of this. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, false brethren unawares brought in who came in privately to spy out our liberty. So these people just trolled inside Paul's ministry to spy out his liberty of preaching the gospel. Now you can tell right here this is very familiar with the previous trolls that we've had in our church. Amen. So people who act like that, you know, and they call themselves saved Christians, it makes you wonder, just reading from Galatians, if they are really saved. False brethren unaware came in privately to spy. Let's keep reading right here. Um, spy on our liberty, which we have in Christ, right? We have liberty in a church Sunday service, right? And we all go, amen. How many of you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture? Amen. And then these people spy out, you know, like that. Spy out while we're rejoicing in liberty. And they feel very uncomfortable after that, too. We've seen that. Okay, so let's keep reading here. Which we have in Christ Jesus. That's We have liberty in Christ Jesus every Sunday. Uh, Midweek services. So there are people who come in the spy. That they might bring us into bondage. So these trolls who want to bind people into the Jewish law of Moses, they go inside Paul's ministry, they spy out how they're singing their hymns, and then when one person throws a hymn book, then they try to take a picture of that and think, oh, see that? See that? These guys, look at these people. Look at these people right here. What heretics? See, they're like literally trolls, exactly like that. Taking five to seven second clips of a preacher pe uh -huh. speaking, and they'll show that to the apostles, and they'll say, see, look at this heretic right here. Yeah. You know? That's what they were doing with the apostle Paul. So that, why? They might bring us into bondage, because they're trying to force you back into their belief. So you got to realize this, is that as a Bible-believing church, you got to realize it is inevitable, it will happen, there will be so-called, say, Christians, and they'll be unaware, you can't even tell. They'll just troll inside and then try to spy out our liberty where we're worshiping Jesus Christ, and then that way they can catch you and then demonize you, and then that way they can force you back into their belief. So this is the idea of a loser on the internet who trolls us. Amen. The idea is you must be a post-tribber and anti-Semite. Why? Because I took a five-second clip of a preacher where you look crazy right there. Uh -huh. See, that is perfectly matching with Galatians chapter 2, with those kind of losers online who brag about, oh, we're doing a great work, a great work, and they don't number more than 20 churches around the whole world. That's right. Great work. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious, man. So, let's look at right here. We're going to look at verse 5. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Amen. We can't give place and subject to these whims of these so-called false brethren who come in and spy and try to get on us. 
We can't even subject to them, not even for an hour. That's important as this church. So we're not going to bow the knee to Baal, no matter how much they try to catch us. Amen. So we're not going to bow the knee to Baal. We're going to keep on going. We're not going to give place into subjection, not even for an hour. We can't do that. That's important. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Because that's what it's about, folks, to keep continuing the truth of proclaiming God's word. If this, if this ministry bowed the knee to Baal, then we wouldn't have gotten some people saved or people coming to our church, etc., knowing Bible-believing truth. Switching to the King James Bible, converting to dispensationalism. How this all happened? Because we did not get placed into subjection, not even for an hour. Amen. So that the truth of the gospel can keep spreading. Verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. So you can tell by the tone of the language here <clears throat> what Paul is talking like. But of these who seem to be somewhat. So Paul is saying, like, these people who seem like they're, they're know-it-alls. We're the new IFB. See, they seem somewhat. They seem like that. But Paul's saying right here, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. Whatever you want to call yourself, it doesn't matter to me. Amen. Right? Call yourself new, 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 whatever. There is nothing new under the sun, as the Bible says. Amen. <clears throat> Just sounds like the New King James Version to me when you want to say new, new, new. All right? That makes things better, I guess. <clears throat> God accepted no man's person. See, God doesn't care. He doesn't care about a man's person, his reputation, who he is. God, so Paul's like, I don't care who you are, because God don't even care who you are. <laughs> For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. <clears throat> so these people who seem to be somewhat something, but actually when you deal with them in conference, you actually carry no weight to Paul. It's like, ah, oh, you're nothing to me. It's all hot air. Blah, 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 online. And then when you actually deal with them in conference in person, you realize, man, that was just hot air. You're a nothing. Amen. You're a nobody, man. You're a nobody. 